some of the facilitators today, along with Ms. Laura McCready, um, and Carlina Allen Canty, and Zach, Judge Ed Jackie Walker there, Natalie McGarram, right up here, and she's our timekeeper. Kristen Robinson in the front, Steve Johnson, he is our um, website and, and technology person, and we have this speaker Cheryl, and she's our guest. So we always start out with a prayer. So Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> Would you bow your heads and join me as we pray, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful today for our lives, for our health, for our strength. We are thankful for all school board members present today. Let us remind them that they are not alone, that you, board members, and God is always there for you. He will go before you and will literally hand you your victories and you victories as they move forward, as you move forward in obedience to God. God bless our children everywhere, all the time. Bless our country, these United States. Bless our state, North Carolina, our county, Mecklenburg, our city, Charlotte, our neighborhoods, our homes. It's in your son Jesus' name I pray. Let us say together, amen. Amen. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to run from 8.30 to 9.45. I'm going to take announcements and let that. Okay, um, what we usually do, what we always do, I should say, is that you will get to introduce yourself and then um, if you want to, I guess what we want to know today, we just want an update since you have been uh, elected, you give an update about history or about the school board as a whole. We know we're looking for a new superintendent. We can get an update on that. Also, um, I think there's a bond and uh, I think I saw somewhere where you didn't get everything you wanted and you had to eliminate some things. Am I right? Or something about that. But whatever we need, and we just need an update from the since we have been elected. And I think all of you are new to the place. Okay. Yeah. So this is a real uh, big deal. Okay. <laughs> it's been a bit really good. So you can tell us how you how you are adjusted to this new new moment. That you have. And then um, after they speak, we are going to take questions from the audience. And remember that you have to raise your hand, and I will call on you in the order that you raise your hand. Okay? So um, that's the way we do it. Natalie will, Natalie will keep the time. We'll give you um, maybe 30 seconds to ask your question. You know, because we don't want a lot of problems here, so if you can ask your question in 30 seconds, that's great. And then they can um, answer if you want to ask one person that you live in the district and you want to ask them something, that's fine. You can ask one person or you can ask a question for everybody to uh, answer. Okay, so we have here, I'm going to read from here. We have Ms. Um, Melissa Easley from District 1. We have Lisa Klein from District 5. I think I've known Lisa longer than I've known anybody before <laughs> because we used to work together. So, so we were really young. And we were so young. So long we were, ago, we were at least ten, oh yes. We were like new friends. <laughs> so we were in work together. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I just have a special, you know, relationship with me. Okay. Stephanie Steed, who is the vice chair of this, and she's representing District 4. And we have D ranking, who is District 3. Okay? So we're going to we'll start and go this way. I don't want to do this. Okay. So, you know, each of you can speak maybe um, a few minutes. You know, I'll say three, three, four, you know, whatever you need. So then we're going to take questions because most of your, what you're going to say is going to come from the questions. So you don't need to speak longer than, you know, a couple of minutes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Melissa Easley. I am the representative for District 1. 
So I work with North Charlotte, Huntersville, Cornelia, and Davidson. So that's the area that I am in. Um, I have, for those of you that don't know me, I was an educator for 10 years in CMS, working in the south and east side of the city. Um, and so that area has always been near, it continues to be near and dear to my heart as well, even though I moved recently up north. So um, I have been very heavy into um, making sure that you know, we've got some really good things on the bond package. I really feel very confident in a lot of what we're doing. Um, as as was mentioned, of course, we would love to see everything on there. Unfortunately, that's not realistic. So um, I'm really excited to see what we're putting forward. Um, and as far as just anything else, I think you know, my colleagues will also chime in as well. Um, I think we're really in a good position. And um, I really enjoyed my time so far on the board. It's been a lot of work, it's been a, a lot of work with a lot of different coffee, but, um, you know, drinking from fire hose, but we got this. It's all good. <laughs> so thank you for having me here this morning. Good morning. I'm Lisa Klein. I represent District 5. District 5 goes from Matthews, scoops down to South Charlotte, and goes up to Dilworth. So it's like a little C on the south side of Charlotte. Um, for those of you know that Mary and I've known each other a long time, I was in CMS 39 plus years, had 10 years out of state. So really I have 40 years of educational experience. And I will tell you, it's been nice seeing everything. It's from going from a teacher to an administrator. I was very fortunate that I worked not only on the south side, but I worked on the west side. And then when I worked in curriculum with Mary, I worked all over Charlotte. So I, I've seen a lot of changes. We do have a big bond package ahead of us. It would have been nice to have gotten all 125 projects that we need desperately in the district. But with the cost of materials, it's just not possible. And plus asking for that amount of money with the voters we know is, is just not feasible. We're also looking at reassignments and changing of district boundaries so that students are, can go from elementary to middle to high school together, a nice flow. We did delay that mainly because we needed to get the capital improvement plan ahead of us, and then we can look at reassignment. It's been great. All of us have gelled. I think the board has a very positive viewpoint, and we take time to listen to each other and hear each other's points of views. We may not always agree, but we all agree on two things, that parents, and children, children, number one, parents are our, our priority. So with that in mind, it's been great. And it's been a whirlwind. Oh, wasn't sure if we were done. Look, I'm Stephanie Sneed. I um, was elected from District 4, which is runs from like the center city area, like the Cherry neighborhood, all the way east uh, down Abermar Road, almost to, uh, all of, essentially all of the east side to 485 almost, and then it makes a hook to the right um, to Mint Hill. Um, I do serve as a vice chair of the board. Just um, my update is, is that you know that this has been fast and furious. We were elected December 13th, so we have been in this for eight, nine weeks. I think it's the start of the nine week. So we have a couple of, a lot of big items going on. One, we have a superintendent search happening. I serve on that committee as well as uh, board member Klein. We are searching for a superintendent that is going to be with us for a while and is ready to make some really impact on our, our students and our families and that they're going to oversee um, 181 schools and 140, 41,000 uh, students. Our trajectory for our timeline right now is that we hopefully will have uh, selected and have a contract with the new superintendent at May, by May 8th. The other thing which uh, Board Member Klein talked about is that we have a, a capital improvement project um, comprehensive review going on now. We did start with 125 schools. It has been narrowed to a list of 30 schools 
is a $2.9 billion bond package. Now, what does that mean at this stage? At this stage, we will have to have discussions with the county commission, which we have a joint meeting March 4th from 9 to 12, where we'll begin to start talking about the amount that, because we have we don't have taxing authority on the school board, so that authority has to come from the, from the county, and we have to, so they'll determine the amount, and then it'll have to go to the state before you see it on your ballot. But hopefully that will be, um, we'll be in agreement on the 30 projects. Well, they're not going to select the project, but the amount that's going to support 30 mm -hmm. projects, and it'll be on your ballot in November. Um, we have a legislative, a robust legislative agenda, which we can go into that addresses everything from making sure there's a nurse in every school, from teacher pay, restoring master's pay, allowing retirees to return to work, um, longevity pay, also wants to also deal with some things that will help us, our students and our families, like seeking um, free bus free bus passes for our, all of our staff as well as as well as our high school students, as well as uh, making sure we have free lunch in every school for every student. That's that's a snippet of it, um, but there's much more to that. And the last thing, of course, is that we're still con continuing the student um, outcome focused governance work. And that is the specific work is how do we make an ch impact and change the trajectory for our student outcomes. And we have four goals that's related to that, which I'm sure that we'll talk more about later. Well, Mr. Rankin can talk about it because he's the chair of that new committee um, that's specifically focused on student outcome focused governance. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is D Rankin. I am the Board of Education representative for District 3. Um, it's always a pleasure for me to come to the Tuesday morning breakfast forum because um, this is where I got the, the bug. Uh, when, I, when I came, when I was even thinking about just being involved in the community, <clears throat> I was told um, you need to go to the Tuesday morning breakfast forum. And so I started attending over at you know, West Charlotte and going to meetings on Tuesday morning before I go to work and just become involved and informed. And I was just uh, intrigued about the, the uh, communication, the involvement, uh, the importance. It was, it was really important just to, to see all the individuals there that obviously had the respect of the entire community because of you know, what Ms. Sarah created. Um, so thank you for the invite. I, I'm always a pleasure for me to be here. Um, so, like Stephanie said, I, um, I will be, we, I just came back from a conference about, about student, student outcome focused governance. I will be leading that charge. After coming from that conference, I'm really, really excited to really begin focusing on how can we improve student outcomes with a, with a strategic manner, um, being intentional with even down to monitoring the amount of time that we spend on our board meetings and what we talk about. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, in addition to that, um, we will be reviewing, if you don't know by now, some of our magnet programs. Um, not this, not this immediate time, but in the near future, we will be reviewing, you know, some magnet changes in the community at some of our schools and how we, how that's mat mat matching up with our um, our CIP. Um, so thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to answering any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Mr. Patel. And I just wanted to let you know I forgot to do this. Let you know that we do have a virtual audience. So there's more people that are tuning in and setting up. Also, um, I do want to recognize some um, at large members who are here, and that is Jennifer Dilla Hall, who is here. She's on the school board. She's an at large uh, member of the school board. And also, the Lord Ship just mm -hmm. came in, and she's on the school board. Also, she's at large. Uh, today, we just have districts. Also, we have Louise Wood here, and she's a former school. Okay. So, thank you very much for your all for being here. Okay, um, Winston has a question. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming. I wanted to know just personally, as individual uh, members of the, the board, what are factors individually that are important to you? Uh, that the next uh, a superintendent has or possess? Or what are those qualities you're looking for? I'll start. I think for me, it's the connection with our educators, with our students on the ground. Um, it is making sure that they are open to feedback, 
they're opening to listening to our educators and to make sure that that line of communication is happening because they're the ones that see the every day. They're the ones that are hand in hand, the closest to our students that actually see what's happening in the classroom, what's happening in the school, and a superintendent that can take that feedback because they can't be everywhere at every moment of every time. And so using the teacher as a pipeline for feedback to improve all of our schools and all of our students. I'll go, we'll just go down the row. I, I want a superintendent who's going to not only work with teachers, but work with the community. It is important that we raise standards for our children and challenge them so that they are competitive with kids in other counties and other states. So I want to make sure that he is hearing, he or she is hearing from the community as to what they feel is needed in the schools. So um, one of the things, so the words that are sticking out to me is that they are transformational, um, that they have proven results and are committed to change the directory for our students and has a connection to the community and be able to be coalition build. Um, but the number one quality that for me is that they don't have a deficit view of children. I mean, oftentimes we hear language that is, you know, a child is but this, they are, you know, they are poor, they are whatever the case may be, but they can learn and they can ex perform and they can, you know, rise to the level of the standards that we require. So they cannot have a deficit view of children. Um, and then of course, be able to lead and not be afraid to make changes. Those are the qualities that I think are important. For me, um, first, the first thing is um, equity centered. I think we have to understand that um, we have a very diverse um, district and that there are certain populations that may require more resources than others. And we have to be, uh, hopefully the next superintendent, that's one of the qualities they understand that is you have to be equity focused and you have to be, have a true understanding and appreciation that we are a district that believes in student outcomes focused governance. If you don't believe in that, this may not be the place for you. Because we, we truly want to make sure we're focused on student outcomes and that's how we're gonna govern we're going to place those same expectations on you and hopefully you'll be able to manage the district in the same manner. Um, of course, great leadership skills, um, data driven because data is what we use to figure out, um, are we moving in the right direction? You know, we know that test scores doesn't mean everything, but at least give us, give us an idea of where we are. Um, be able to gain the respect of this cabinet and be able to lead and work to collaboratively with the cabinet. Um, I think that's very important. But and lastly, be, be teacher slash staff focused, um, understanding and, and appreciate those are the drivers of our district. And if the decisions that are made up here um, don't have any regard for the individuals that are on the day to day, um, that doesn't show good leadership skills to me. I think you have to be have to make sure you have input um, from our teachers, from our teacher assistants, even down to our bus drivers, to our cafeteria workers. Hopefully the superintendent understands the magnitude of the decisions that are made up top and have regard for the individuals that, are, that do the day-to-day. -hmm. Uh, uh, okay, um, I'd like to, to get an answer from everyone's sure. performance. Can you share with us uh, your most accomplishment that you have been able, uh, that you have been able to uh, push through or uh, have the rest of the uh, school board members recognize today, particularly as it relates to your district since you've been in office. Just individually, or your district particularly, but so we want to make sure that the system is going to be better. Of course, we've been criticized so much for our school board work and we have what things have happened. So tell us what you've done. Visually, that's changing the perception. I'll be able to talk to you about it. Um, I can start actually. Oh, so it's a couple of things, particularly for the east side. And I wanted to share this because I almost forgot, so it was a good question. So, um, for the east side, 
there was a particularly I participated in with County Commissioner Marjorell, as well as who's District 4, represents the East Side, and City Council members Dante Anderson, who's District 1, Marjorie Molina, who's District 5, um, uh, East Side Summit. And so the purpose of the summit was to find out what issues that they wanted us to work on collaboratively, like what's important. So just to share, and I think this kind of resonates across the community too, as we go through. So it's like, what was, what did they want us to work on intergovernmental? And some people here participated in, in that, um, in that event as well. So the number one thing, which was good that came out of that conference, as you can see by far is that you can't see this, but it says education and that includes education, early childhood, public post post-secondary, higher ed, um, after-school vocational. The second thing that they wanted us to work on collaborative was affordable and workforce housing. The third thing is um, safety and community violence issues. The fourth is economic development. The fifth is economic mobility. The sixth is transit and transportation. And then the seventh is workforce development. So that gives you an idea of where people think that we should not be operating in silos and then we should work together. Not to take too much time, I'll just give you the top one. And then we did it individually, like what is an individual board member that they think are issues that are pertinent specifically to the East Side to address. And the number one issue was teacher pay, recruitment and retention and um, incentives. The second one is student outcomes and achievement. And the third is closing achievement gap. Fourth is support staff that includes nursing, psychologists, counselors, and then the fifth is, is safety. That's just kind of give you the top five. And I will say that the legislative agenda um, addresses some of these so that, you know, I consider that an accomplishment. And then, of course, we always want to be student outcome um, centered. Well, um, for me, okay, uh, for me, um, we, we've you know, it's been a short time, but we've had a lot of engagement um, around our um, our bond package and what we're presenting. And I think being able to communicate um, and participate in the different community engagement sessions, I think uh, between myself and Stephanie, we've been working closely with Charlotte East. Because um, starting out in that, in that bond package, um, I think it was very questionable what was being offered to Gander. Gander is one of the schools that's in my district. So if you don't know what, what my district runs, it runs from, if you know what Macquarie Heights and everything north up to High Park, Trinity Park, and over to the east, all the way through um, True Creek, Dorada, uh, Hidden Valley, Plaza, Shannon Park, all the way to Robinson Church Road, and that's where it stops. So it's kind of northwest to northeast Charlotte. So one of the, the schools in my district is Gander. Um, so starting out, it was it wasn't really specific what was being offered. Um, I think through um, consistent conversation, communication with staff, um, we were able to um, come to I think a very um, good space to uh, the course offerings with you know um, more of a couple more magnet programs that will can kind of that can attract um, some of the I was I'm just going to say more of the affluent members that live in that that they're assigned to Garinger. That's the goal to make Garinger more diverse. If you know, um, if you are from Charlotte, you know Garinger used to be somewhat diverse. Where all those individuals it used to be very diverse, just kind of like where Charlotte used to be. Um, so now it's totally changed. So hopefully, with those new magnet changes and voice from the community, and through uh, you know some of our advocacy, talking with staff, that was a benefit. Um, so I think that's one thing that I've been able to do for uh, so far in my district. Uh, district five. And part of District 6 are getting a new high school, and it's affecting both districts. And even before we took office, I was attending community meetings with elementary schools, along with Summer. I know Melissa came to one. We were hearing from everybody, we want this, we want that. We, we don't want to go to this school. We don't want to go to that school. And you need to make that decision in February. <laughs> And we weren't going to, I, I did not feel comfortable making that decision, especially when we'd only been on the board now nine weeks. It was not going to be fair to the community. It was not going to be fair to the children. 
and we talk to each other. That's the best part of this is that we're talking to each other about what's best for the children. And we delayed the vote. We are working on the capital improvement because that's a, another vote that we have to deal with. But I felt like that was an accomplishment that we can delay it so we can really look at re student reassignment and assignment to the new high school because it does affect so many children and it's going to be a long-term effect on all the communities. So delaying it was, uh, to me, a big win. Um, I do want to mention the uh, legislative agenda. Um, I think we realize that there is a barrier to getting every nurse in every school. And um, I did some background research and found out that it's a state law that a nurse in a school has to have a bachelor's degree. And so our LPNs, our, t our nurses that have been nurses for 30 plus years, cannot be a nurse in school. And that would that significantly cuts down our higher school um, where we can get a nurse in every classroom or in every school. And so to have that, uh, you know, working through that with some of the county commissioners and with uh, you know, vice chair's need, um, we were able to get that on the legislative agenda to have that removed or have that changed so that, you know, moving forward, we can get quality nurses, years of experience, you know, our, our true, you know, having a nurse in every school. So I was really proud that that got put on the legislative agenda. Um, I think I'm really proud of individually is my communication with my members, not only in my own district, but around the county. Um, and I, you know, I put out a newsletter, I had in individual engagement, both virtual and in person. Um, I really am very proud in how I have been communicating with the district. So you're all welcome to sign up for my newsletter. It comes out usually the first week of the month. Um, I generally focus it towards district one, but there are some over things on there as well that everyone should be updated on. Um, and I'm just, I'm really proud to be working with with these people up here and, and Jennifer and Lenora and everybody else, you know, it's a real accomplishment for me to get on the board to be voted in and I, and I cherish that. Um, and I'm very, I feel very lucky to be here and to be able to sit at the table and do the work and to think what's best for kids and to think what's best for our district. And um, even with all our shortcomings, I'm very proud to be a former CMS teacher and now on the CMS board, I'm very proud of CMS. And while we have ways to fix, you know, and, and issues to to overcome, I think um, you know I'm, I'm I'm really proud to be here, and I want to continue to that shine that through the board. Thank you. Here. Um, over the course of time, there have been two major lawsuits that have really changed the landscape of what CMS is. Um, Board Member Rankin actually alluded to the diversity that used to be at Garinger. That's really across CMS as a whole. Well, I guess legalities. What's the impediment to really changing the bylaws or policies or whatnot, whatever the case for CMS, to shift it back to um, a school system that actually practices busing kids from certain neighborhoods into other schools so that there is parity, so, there, so that there is equity within these schools um, and within the education that these kids are receiving? What's the impediments to you as a board changing this bylaws? It doesn't have to be done by a lawsuit. Well, I'll start. Okay. Well, legally, we can't bus, right? So we have to, like I said, it could be a law, a counter lawsuit. I think it was a Kathy Connelly. I can't say his last name. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> right. So he came in and just shook up the district. We know that. Um, so it could be a counter lawsuit, which I doubt would be successful. But what we can do as a board is be intentional how we do student assignment. There are certain schools that are in certain areas that are just uh, that can create diversity, right? Because this is where they're located. Um, if you know Charlotte pretty well, look at Garinger. That's a that's a diverse area. If, if it's drawn correctly, it could be very diverse. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to include West Charlotte in it. It could be more diverse because um, if you remember um, parts of you know Center City. Uh, other areas of those of the of the, the of the of the city 
are supposed to be going to where Charlotte, but how they're drawn right now, you know, everybody wants to go to a certain school that's green and white. Okay. So, but there are certain areas where we can, if we really be specific and draw the lines with fidelity, we can create diversity. Some of the schools in university area chambers can be drawn with fidelity. Like it, you, university is diverse. Um, you know, so if we, if we do that with intentionality, we can probably do a better job of creating um, diverse schools. And, and, and um, when we do get to the magnet program, making sure all of our schools have the same opportunity to take the same classes, same opportunity. With, if it's, a, if it's a, um, a language program in the north, it needs to be a language program in the south and the same one in the east. It needs to be some of the same IB program here, IB program there. So we need to be intentional with the programs that we're putting there. And um, hopefully, I said, we, when we do get a new superintendent, those are some of the things that would be at the top of the list of, of diversity and equity in our schools. Yes, um, I want to go back to the question because we ask all these questions, but I think that uh, it's very important that in order for any of the things that we talk about today to be accomplished, we have to have a great leader. And uh, I know that the time, for, the parameters that you have as far as the time, you talked about having someone type thing. I want to make sure that your minds haven't been made up. And that we actually <clears throat> were doing a national search and that we bring in individuals. But I heard a couple of you say community input was very important. So I want to know how we're going to engage the community in this process and um, how we're going to engage the community process. I, you know, you have a, a where we get to hear them, but do you get to hear us? Because I'm in the community, and I hear um, all the time, are we going to be involved engaged in this process? And how are you going to accept the feedback? And will you really accept the feedback, or have you made it So, uh, so I'm not on the committee. So I'm going to suggest the first part. No, I have not made up my mind. I have not even met anybody because I am not on the committee. So I haven't even met the search firm yet. So there is absolutely no way that I have even, I haven't even made in my head, <laughs> let alone made up my mind. So I'm gonna let Rabbi Cersei, she is, and, and, and Chairwoman uh, Klein, because they're on the committee, they can give you more of the background of the community engagement. But I can tell you that there is nobody, there is not even a team being thrown out or even talked about, there are no names. There are no, there is no, none of that. I think she means that after we know who we're going to interview, that's what Well, I, is that what you were going well, for? Yeah. Yeah. After and you went out. Yes. Uh, let's yes. defer. Thank you. Yeah, let's defer to Chair Vice Chair Sneed because she has been intricately involved yes. every. So it's a couple of things. One, the, the search firm is BWP. Um, it is. It is a diverse search firm. That was one of the things that we specifically wanted to make sure that they had the ability or had proven record of hiring um, superintendents that have stayed in their school districts a while and a superintendent that has dealt with um, diverse, <laughs> excuse me, diverse school populations. You'll hear from the search firm at our next board meeting on February 28th, they will be addressing the board and, and in turn addressing the public. So the second thing is their um, civility localized did um, conduct community engagement before this search, like before we before any of us were on the board. And there is a report from civility localized that you can that you have access to. Um, and but I can tell you, and that was the community engagement, right, of what the community wants in superintendent. But I can tell you that it was deficient, you know, particularly in the Crescent area. So what we have talked about with the search firm is doing additional community engagement, which will happen um, in, in particularly target areas that we saw. And even that was, I think that was our first board meeting. And I think uh, most of us made that observation and say, hey, you know, there was a map that you could see and it was a huge void 
of who of who um who it, who responded to surveys and in those community engagement sessions? So we're going back and having BWP do that again. And those those dates, I believe, those are going to happen is March seventh and eighth, um, or the initial dates that we have so far for community engagement. So I'll be reaching out to you, uh, Miss Canty, um, in order to make sure because we know who our community leaders are in these areas to say, hey, can you? We need you to help us rally people to respond to those issues. So yes, and so we haven't even gotten any any names yet. So the process will be um, community members. If you have someone in mind, if board members have someone in mind. If an applicant themselves have more, uh, some uh, want to uh, uh, believe they or have the skills to do this job, you can submit your name to BWP, which will be up on our web, which will be up on the website this week. The applications will start and they will, they're going to go through that process and then they're going to bring us, you know, help us whittle it down to four to six candidates. That'll be the first round, second round to be, you know, two to three candidates. And then we'll, you know, go from there um, to, to make a selection. So we haven't gotten any names yet. We don't, the application period is not even open, but every person that submits will be considered. Even if, like I said, if any of you have an idea of somebody that has the skills to be a great superintendent, feel free to submit that to BWP as well. They've already said they've gotten calls from some community members that have reached out to them to say, I think this person will be a great superintendent. I don't, I don't have any idea who those names have been submitted yet. Okay, we just want to make sure that the community has some. I think this is what Ms. Um, Canty was saying that we just want to make sure that the community has a chance to meet these people and, um, you know. So, so we will be discussing what that looks like. I can tell you that the initial stage um, is, and we've, we've discussed this openly, is that, um, you know, especially if you're a prior superintendent or current sitting superintendent. There has to be some confidentiality in the process until the final stage, right. until the very final stages. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. My question is, BWP, is this our first time using BWP? Yes. When we do the contracting, I know that in the past, it's been three, four, five year contract. There's no room in there. Uh, and then we fire them before the contract's up and then we pay them. There's no progression on their ability to provide us what they say they're going to do. And they're checking balance in place to say after year one, you said you were going to do this, we should be here. Benchmarking, where is that in line with the contract? Because when we get tired of them, we're going to fire them and pay them for the remainder of the contract. Then they're going to bring in four or five people like this last person did, putting people like ahead of all of our people who's been running the, in the district, who knows the ins and outs, we're not a superintendent, not his cronies. So when they go, then we lose, the county loses a whole lot of money and we're stuck with the bill. So I think that when we hire a superintendent, we hire a superintendent. And we already have the other people in place in the city who's doing the work. So he comes in and brings all of his crew, then our people get subsided or pushed to the back as if they haven't done anything for us. So are we looking internally for those positions to still be maintained by the people that are there? He's going to bring in his crew and save us all. So we hire the superintendent. We're going to tell the superintendent what our goals are. The superintendent's job is to execute that right. And that means they make an analysis with staffing. So I can't make the representation for the superintendent to say this, all of these um veteran members of CMS staff or cabinet will remain. We can't say that. They have to They have, to have the, the ability to execute and have staffing that they believe is going to help execute the goals. And whether that is with the current CMS team members or not, that, that is a determination that's, that, that the superintendent, or a evaluation that whoever's the new superintendent is going to make. And many of the leaders have contracts so the contracts may end when the new superintendent comes on board or a year after that. Those were predetermined contracts. But to your point, having someone who is here for two or three years 
we have to look at the contract when we're developing it. And again, having benchmarks, great idea, definitely something that we would consider putting certain goals each year for the superintendent to meet. And I was on record here the last time, they shouldn't have one put in the door and out the door and any, I would hope we would consider having them not involved in other activities as representing the superintendent. Their focus should be CMS. I didn't want to respond to that too as well. Um, so the superintendent does have the auto autonomy to, you know, feel who's best to help he or she lead the district. That's something out of our control. But we, we do have the power of an evaluation and each year of that superintendent. Contract. Right of evaluation based on performance and what we're going to what what we're going to use are our goals and guardrails, which is part of our SOFG work. And in between those different times, we have what's called progress monitoring um, throughout the year. So we can we should be we should have an idea of hey, Mr. or Mrs. Superintendent, where are you on this particular goal? And throughout the year, we should be saying is there progress? Or should there be a shift in the in in the in the plan? At the end of the year, we're gonna the the superintendent will be, will be measured on how are you achieving these particular goals? Uh, th these are our four to five important things. Where are you? So by the time let's say if it's I don't know I'm gonna say I'm just throw it out there three year you know contract by year two we should know um, if this is the the correct person that's leading our district in the right in the right place. Through the evaluations and the progress monitoring. Yes, um, thank you so much for coming. We've talked about student outcomes and the evaluation um, of the superintendent. What are your goals and how should we evaluate you when you bring that next year? Okay, so um, I, I started out the campaign with several goals. One of them was to commute, to improve the communication between the board and the community. One was to improve our communication and our relationship between intergovernmental, so between the city council, between the uh, uh, county commission, and, and third, with our staff. And not just our teachers, but our custodial staffs, our HR staff, like, across the board and you know that is what i've been working towards and that is what i've been doing and what, what i've been focusing on and part of being communicated and open with the public is to be making sure that we are aligning with your goals and your values and your ideas of what you want in our schools and so that is why i have been very much out in the community listening to you getting feedback um you know, coming to, to different forums like this so that we can hear what your concerns are, what your questions are, and, and respond accordingly. Um, you know, as far as evaluating me, I would hope that um, you would look at what I've done, what, I, what I'm working for, and, and being that open person and having that, that consistent dialogue between the community or between the different entities. Um, yeah. I also attended a D on the SOFG uh, conference this weekend. It was very invigorating. It was very, um, very interesting. And it really came up with a lot of ideas on how we can bring the community into this work specifically into our goals and outcomes. And so that's the part that I really kind of grasped onto this weekend. And um, D and I will be working, I'm sure we'll be working together to make sure that you understand what is our focus of government, what we're doing and where we're going forward with this so that you can use that to not only evaluate us, but our superintendent and our staff as well. What is, what is the uh, SLFG? It's student outcome focused governance and it's the goals and guardrails that we talk about during the school board meeting when we do monitoring and those reports and we ask those strategic questions. It, it's all of that and it's focusing on our student outcomes not necessarily adult outcomes or necessarily our adult events. It's focusing on what the students can and should be able to do. So can I, I mean, I know you're gonna answer this. <laughs> just, well, I just wanna, just so you can get an idea, you know, we have four goals and 
you know, they're reported on um, a certain case. And then I'm not going to go through the interim goals as well. But for example, goal one is the percent of black and Hispanic third grade students combined who score at a college and career ready level. That's a four or five will in in English language arts will increase from 15.9 percent in October 2021 to 50% by October 2024. That's one goal. Goal two is the percentage of high school students who score college and career readiness levels of four or five and math one will increase from less than 5% in October 2021 to 25% by October 2024. The third goal is the percent of graduates earning a state high school endorsement will increase from 61% um, in June 2021 to 75% by June 2024. The fourth goal is the percent of schools who meet or exceeded expected educated value added a system assessment systems EVOS uh, growth will increase from 71% in October 2019 to 95% by October 24. So that's what student outcome focus governance is. The board determines what the goals are for the district. And then there are interim goals as well. Um, but those are the four over, overarching goals. I'm saying that's, well, no, I'm just, he asked what student outcome focus governance, like, I mean, I guess in every, if we individually would answer what that is. I mean, okay. But those are the goals for the board. So you can evaluate. I mean, that is a, a measure to evaluate not only the board, for one, because we are supposed to be spending 50% of our time in meetings. That's our goal is to spend 50% of our time in meetings addressing these goals, right? Um, so I do think that there is some accountability for board members for student achievement. So for me personally, yes. Um, you know, that is a goal to make sure that we're having an impact to make sure every student has an exceptional education and that it leads them to college or career readiness. Do I think this is going to be turned around in a year or two? Absolutely not. But should we progress have been made? Absolutely. Should there be intentional actions? Yes, that's what you can, that's what I can be judged by. The other thing is for me is um, that there is improvement like for teachers to teachers and staff. And that includes recruitment and retention efforts, incentive efforts, um, as well as um, to make sure that we're collaborating with not only our community partners, but our other, other intergovernmental entities, that there are successes in those areas. So to follow up on the goals, I've been going into the schools, the schools in District 5, meeting with the principals, but not just the principals, the teachers and the students to see what's actually what the work is going on in the schools because again we have these goals but unless we're actually there seeing what's happening and saying what can we do to support you what can i do what questions can i ask senior staff that maybe you're not comfortable asking and i get a lot of that and then with the people in the community they'll I found my phone rings constantly. I'm getting emails. I have a concern about what's going on in my child's school. Well, then let's sit down. So that is what I'm doing. It's that face-to-face -face contact, just like today, is important. And actually being in that classroom and seeing the work that the teachers are doing is important because then I can say, yes, they are. This teacher is doing what they're we've asked. They are, and what techniques working in this school? Well, it should be able to work in another school. Let's have a let's have a, a conversation. So that's what I'm doing. It's the teacher ed. If I, I want to just really quickly, um, so how you can hold, how you can evaluate me, and uh, as a board member, is am I governing in such a way that represents your values? Um, am I governing in such, because that's, that's my role as a board member. I'm not going to be in the classroom. I'm not going to be at the school level. Um, I'm not going to be at the learning community superintendent level. What I will be is I'm, my job is to govern in such a way that I'm creating a framework and environment to where that can, they, these goals can be met. So I want you to, to evaluate me on, 
am I voting in such a way that represents your values? Is there policy that's being created that represents the values and where we're trying to go? Um, am I responding? If there's issues that you may have in the community and you're responding to me, am I addressing those needs? Am I, am I, sending, am I making sure I'm getting you to the, to the person that can really deal with the issues? Because I'm not going to be the one that's going to go down to that principal and tell them what to do. But what I will do is make sure it gets addressed. So hold me accountable to those things. Hold me accountable to am I addressing your needs? Am I governing in such a way that represents the values of the community and what the needs are of our students? Okay. Um, Pam, you on the list. I have all of you raised your hands, but I do have a list. Okay, and I'm trying to go in the order that people um, ask. Okay, so Chris. Hey, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So you say I have a student that's at West Charlotte. And we chose that school because um, of the history and student base. So, with that being said, it's diversity. Is that really the key to equitable funding? Like, is that what it takes to get the funding that that school needs? Me? Well, well, there's obviously been a lot of funding that's put into West Charlotte now because it's a very beautiful school now. So when I say diversity, when we're talking about diversity, um, I'm, I'm not talking about it's, it's, it's I'm not talking about always talking about race. It's my socioeconomic status. It's, it's different. It's a difference, right? So the the experience of school is just different when you ex that that's a, that's a part of it also. How you socially adapt to other individuals, not just the reading and writing. So I'm not saying just because you sit beside somebody that's a different race than you that you're going to perform better. That's not what I'm saying. But you, I'm saying that that's the purpose of school. School is, is more than just sitting in seats and, and, and learning and regurgitating back facts. It's about being able to be able to experience other individuals other than the person you've been going to school with in your neighborhood from K through 12. There are other people in, the, in other parts of Charlotte that you can learn from and, and kind of learn about their cultures. And that's all a part of education. So that's what I mean when I say um, if there are areas in, the, in, in, in Charlotte to where we could really draw the lines with fidelity to, to where we could have our students to have a, a different experience, I think that would be really good. That's what I'm talking about. If that makes sense. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. You know, having to be here means so much to the community and, and having two people here is such really to have six members of the board who were it's a very good statement about the board and hearing how you work working together and talking to each other. It's fantastic. Thanks. Keep the good work well. And that was our um, um, one thing that I know that you put well, and I think a little late, I think maybe Franklin may have spoken to it when you're actually going to have the enactment code. Um, but anyway, as you look toward the banks, I know you put it off a little bit longer so that you could make good decisions and would be have more time to have continuity, which really was a present in the, the plan and that kind of thing. Um, but as I look at what was originally proposed, um, I, I have concerns about what well, I have questions. Let's put it that way. Now, what is the you know, what is the purpose of magnets now? What does this board see as the purpose of magnets? Because if you looked at what was put up on the sheet, there were different things, and some meet with each other. And I think you're going to have to do some deep math as a board to say what do I think. So. so um, my question is this, as you evaluate magnets and get to making the next decisions about where magnets are, number one, is diversity a key part of it? And if it is, are you looking at not only whether the magnet itself is diverse, but also how that magnet increases or decreases diversity in the other in the community? Um, particularly in diverse communities, which have become um, not diverse in many cases because children are leaving for magnets, the students who could give that diversity to college. So 
But me, that's what we're going. So my question is, how are you going? What are what are you looking for in some magnets? Does it create shiny things that some people can go to and others can't get it to? It will impact your transportation costs. And that bothers. So what is your priority for magnets? And um, you know, how will that be reflected in the evaluation of magnets the decisions that you make? Um, in this kind of that includes talent development offers. I'm going to ask you all to keep your answers brief because we have a long um, list. Okay. So please don't go into a huge commentary. Okay. I want to ask first all the time. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. So I think I'll, what you brought up, and I think we've talked about that before, what you brought up are all important factors to consider magnets. Magnets should not be just considered an opportunity for people not to attend their home school, right? Um, it should be definitely because there is specialized talent development that is of interest to that student and family, and that we provide those avenues in order to do that. Um, but it does have to be evaluated in a sense because some people are choosing magnets because they don't want to go to their home school because they have whatever perception or whatever performance level of the school. That should not be the purpose of magnets. So we have to make sure we, um, look at me going along answer. So yes to what you said, <laughs> all of those things have to be taken into consideration when talking about magnet, magnet programs. I mean, because what we found out in this process is some some schools didn't they they're like we're fine where we are we have these you know we have this td program with this talent development program and we're fine we don't need anything else to come into another program to come in this school um so yes short answer is yes yep yeah. anybody, anybody else want yeah. to i mean everybody does was that for everybody or no, it's really for everybody oh okay i think it, i think stephanie has summed up everything. I worked in magnets. I my children went to magnets. We have to look at improving what's there. I just want yeah, I will. I will say that um, I believe it's okay for me as a parent if I don't want my kid to go to a particular my home school because there's a better opportunity at this particular magnet program because of the program. If that makes sense. So it, just to say, no, it's not good for someone to go. It's not okay for you to not to go to a magnet school because you don't want to go to your home school. But maybe my home school doesn't provide what my, my kid needs. So it's okay for us to be creating these magnet programs across the district to where someone can say, I would rather my kid go to Irwin. Or I would rather my kid go to Northwest School of the Arts because that's not offered in my, in my area because of the program. Now, if we're creating a, a, a magnet program just to create diversity, that's it, not have, having nothing to do with the program, I think that's a problem. Uh, like Because sometimes what happens is um, within these magnet programs, um, it's creating a segregated environment. So if you walk through the, through, through the, through the class, through the school, you'll see, uh, okay, well, the majority of the individuals that are taking advantage of the magnet programs don't look like the individuals in the community. That's where the problem is, but the school looks diverse, but actually it's not. So we have to be careful when we create these programs just to create diversity and not based on the program. Okay, um, yes, we talk a lot about superintendent searches and those things. It's definitely important and on the top of the list. But what I've become concerned about is how our area superintendents are doing and the fact that they pretty much fly under radar most of uh, my community um, can't even identify who the area superintendent is. I'm always more concerned about if I can, as a community member, impact what's closest to our children outside of teaching and learning. The area superintendent seems to be it, but there is very little discussion about how, how, they're, um, how they're evaluated, what, what it looks like to um, what it looks like to have true learning learning communities where each community where that learning community is a true reflection of its community. As you know, there are people in Charlotte who really feel like CMS is too large, um, and we could address that problem with actually strengthening the voice of the area superintendent. Have you guys thought about that? And if so. What mechanism, if you have it, what mechanisms could you use to strengthen 
that particular role. Uh, I'm going to speak up about area superintendents. We have nine. I personally think that's too many. Mainly, and but I may be just my my opinion. We have to have continuity because what one area superintendent will allow, another may not, and then it trickles down into the schools. So the communication between the area superintendents needs to be consistent and the same policies are extended to not only the students, but the teachers and everything that goes on. And I've seen that a lot just in within one particular group in, in District 5, where someone has interpreted a particular policy or process one way, and another has interpreted it different. So you, you have different things going on in different schools. And we don't need that if we are one big district. So I understand what you say about the community superintendents being the representative of the community, but we have to look at what makes up that community super uh, area that they are governed. So what would you do to strengthen that role so that it helps the individual children? I'm going back to my Okay, so what would I do? I would have them meet more regularly, have a better relationship, not only with each other, but with the superintendent. And I'd also streamline it. We have too many chiefs and not enough people working in the schools, so to speak. I, I really think that their role is to support the superintendent, whomever that's going to be, and the superintendent is going to give out the information that uh, the policies that represent the board. Well, my role as a board member, I can't tell them what to do. I can't say you need to do this. Now, I do agree with um, Lisa. I think we do have, I think, just my opinion, I think we do have too many because we just expanded it recently when, the, when our previous interim was here. I think that's too many. But that's not my job to say we need to reduce it because what I will do is hold the superintendent accountable so to show me how is this strategy the best strategy for our district and show me the data behind that. And if it's not working, we're going to hold that superintendent accountable for what he or she is not doing to ensure that those learning, super, learning community superintendents are not engaging with the community and representing the community in such a manner. Um, so that's how that's what I would be able to do. But I can't go directly to that learning community superintendent and tell them what they should and should not do or hold them accountable or anything. That's what, that what the superintendent would do that. Now we'll hold the superintendent accountable for the strategy if they're not accomplishing the goal that we're telling that we, we've charged he or she to do. So I'll say something because I have a different opinion. My opinion is we extend it from six to nine for a reason. And the reason is that our communities, while you said CMS was too big, our communities were too big too. And our super our interim superintendents could not spread themselves that thin. So we made the community smaller so that there was more concrete into a community. I also agree with what Dee said that we we cannot go into, you know. What am I, is Ms. Tangela Williams? I cannot go to, to Ms. Williams and say, you need to be doing this, you need to be doing that. But what I can do is give your feedback to our superintendent and hold them accountable for making sure that our zone superintendents are out in the community being seen, being doing, because they now have a smaller community that they can focus on. Okay, so my question okay. to be an answer, I wasn't asking you to go out to the superintendent. You asked, what could we ask, what could we do? So what we can do is hold the superintendent accountable. Okay, I'm sorry. Shamar, wait a minute. We don't go back and forth. Okay. And I understand that your question wasn't asked. Okay, I understand that. Because what you want is for the superintendent and the area superintendent to be more engaged with the community. So that the community can know. But that's we're going to have to move on. And you all need to just take that into consideration. <laughs> because of the time. So, um, oh, I have a question. <laughs> okay. And you don't have to take a lot of time on my question. Okay, please don't. <laughs> you can just answer it very simply. But I want to know how can you raise 
student achievement in the schools without certified teachers in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. Now, don't answer about how you, there's a shortage of teachers. I know that. But I just want to know, since your focus is student achievement, how can you do it without certified teachers? We know about the shortage, but we got guest teachers and substitutes and all of that. How can you raise achievement with what you have? I'll just say better professional development um, could be a possible way to do that uh, without addressing what you just said about the tension, but improve professional development and support from the district for those individuals that are in the classroom. But they are not getting that. Right, no, correct. That's what I'm saying. So getting those. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so they so improve. They raise the achievement. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have an answer, Steph? Well, I mean, it's the same thing. You make, I mean, it's nothing more significant than what um, Dia said. I mean, we have to make sure that they are getting or have the tools in order to make sure they can execute in that classroom as they should. Um, but I get your position that that's not happening. But then that leads back to we got to make sure we're creating pathways to make uh, that we have the certified teachers in the classroom. So they're not, they're not, those students are not gaining. Um, what they need to gain, okay, and which is your goal is student achievement, yeah. but it's not happening. Okay, go ahead. Well, there are a lot of teacher level people in central office making $80,000 a year. There are five in the math department and they're teacher level. They need to be in the schools. I know that's very unpopular, but we pay their salary. They need to be not just leading PD. They need to be in the schools teaching our children who need us the most. And it's not just math, it's every department. So let's let's reassign those people until we can get more certified teachers. That is, and again, not popular. I see, I see Lenora raising her hand. Yes. We did that for a minute. We did. When COVID, when it was really, really a crisis, back to when we were going through the uh, real big part of Omicron came back, we took teachers from central office and we moved them back in the classroom. And I will tell you, I was personally to the superintendent to ask several times, because I heard it from principal, can we please get some help? So I fought that battle to say, get those people from central office into the classroom, we need that. But we did that temporarily. But as there were morale and concerns with central office staff, kind of pushing back with why they had to be, because they had other jobs. But I will tell you, we really needed to keep those staff from central office in the classroom, science teachers. You are science central office, and we can't find science teachers. I had a principal say he was three science teachers short and couldn't do a thing. And my question was, again, can we bring central office in? Because they're certified and qualified. You know, okay, that's okay. It. <laughs> um, and, just, and, and Lisa knows this because we work together in central office. And we, we were in the into the schools at the beginning yes. of the school year. They were down so many teachers, yes. and we were the teacher. I taught language arts at Eastway Middle School. I taught you know? social studies. Yeah, so we so all we just they deployed us out yes. into the schools, and we taught. And it might have been, you know, for maybe four weeks or. It wasn't until a teacher, a, a certified teacher was hired, yeah. and we didn't complain. We did what we, we were supposed did. to do. Did you have your other responsibilities as well? Yes. Yeah. Yes. But, but, you know, it was minimized. It was, it yeah, was because fun. there was somebody else who went to it. For it. And so now, um, you want to respond? Okay. So I just think that we know that children cannot achieve when they don't have a teacher in the future. Yeah. We know that. So we have a goal out there of uh, student achievement, but we know the people out there can't do it. Can I say something really quickly? If, they, they are some, quick. quick. There are some programs though that are helping, helping the problem. Like UNCC is trying to implement a program. They just started trying to, they're talking about it now to where if you come and do the education program, your edu when you leave, you'll be debt free, but you have to teach in CMS for a certain number of years, trying to intrigue more people okay, to come and right teach. Now, and that's <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can I say something? Um, now, Mitchell is next. I want to say something, then I'll, I'll ask a question. Uh, I subbed at high school level, and in the class, I was a full-time sub, and I made the suggestion that 
from for history class, zoom it from the teacher classroom and let it project up on the screen there, and pe and the kids would be getting the same thing. It go anywhere, but that's an option. Uh, if, if the teachers feel like it's too much work, but the sub could do it. But my question is, that I've been asked to ask is. What are the plans for ensuring that students are in, who are in detention receive appropriate educational support? Mm. That in what? In, yeah. in, in detention. In, in, out, of, out of probably school. out of school. Out of school suspension. School. Yeah. Mm -hmm. school. Yeah. Yeah. All of them. I'm in school. Yeah. Out of school. I got you. And second part of that question is, how does CMS provide educational support to CMS students who are in detention? In another county, they oh, don't have a detention center anymore. Oh, you're talking about detention, like detention. in a oh, YDC, like, YDC. Like, like, yeah. right? Juvenile detention centers, right? Yeah, yeah, the juvenile detention, detention center, center basically they're accused of a crime and they're in one of the detention centers, but so not all was one, but now, yeah, I got you. Or they were in the oh, I got you. Well, I know that we well, know the jail north is not closed, so but CMS was in. The detention center at that time, but it's closed. I don't think that CMS has any jurisdiction in other counties right. um, to be able to provide educational services. Um, but when there it was open, there was CMS was actually in jail north. So right. I can't I can't speak upon that. So there's no, no support for the kids that are out of. As of right now, not that I know. Not, 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 not from CMS, but from whatever county. I don't know if we even county. have. I don't know in in our county if we have anything else anymore. We have no more jail north, um, so I'm not sure if we even have that anymore. Judge Bess. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. They got okay, the next question. They have to Let her answer that. Okay. I have to ask all of you that are here, including uh, at large, on February the seventh. We had a very powerful, dynamic uh, presentation that was, we had the people that were here were alumni mm -hmm. of the black schools that were closed by Jay Sherman, Jay Young, Taurus Biden, Plato Price, Second Order, and some other folks mm -hmm. that were here. But they were seasoned individuals that were here. My ask is that if you haven't looked at that video from Tuesday forward on February the 7th, please look at that. That's ask number one. Ask number two is, once you see it, and you see what happened <clears throat> in segregated times, and how when we tried to integrate, what happened with these seasoned people, they told their stories. So this room is, is full of people that had stories to tell about the school system that our kids need to be educated on. Would you assist us if you feel that it's, it's a good thing to do for our students that's in the school right now as it relates to our history in helping us to make sure that certain schools are presenting this video that we have through Steve, thanks to Steve, so they can see that what they are up against right now and what happened to us 20 and 30 and 40 years ago as it relates to for integration and segregation. So that's those are my answers. And uh, what I want to ask first is, did anyone see that? Did anyone? I haven't that? seen I it yet, I saw it. but I will yeah. though. Okay. Sure. And it was powerful. Yeah. And we want to, as a group, we want this to be shown in Charlotte Mecklenburg school system. So our kids, they don't have a clue about a lot of our history. And the, my question is, how, if you could just tell us shortly, what you feel about what's happening in Florida with the governor there as it relates to the education and our system and our, our history. You're talking about the AP class? Yes, yes. And the, 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 him not wanting to. Want to, to just, a, just a snippet. I mean, it's wrong. It's it's bad. It, 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 it's, it's disgusting. That's all I guess about it. There's nothing to add to it. Okay. <laughs> I know. I'm rushing. Yeah. Yeah. I know. So that's fine. That's all I'm saying. I I just what's happening in Florida. 
history is history and it should be taught. And the video that you sent was very powerful. And I believe that for CMS, for our children to understand the history of what has happened, we need to see it. They need to see it so that we don't repeat. Because if you don't learn from history, you are bound to repeat it. And they need to see what everybody went through. I mean, the short answer, I think in every school, one, elections matter. That's the short answer, too, is that, you know, schools and educational experiences have the obligation to present um, historically accurate, uh, historically uh, complete um, and accurate information um, to our students that's, you know, age and grade appropriate for them. I would say yes, I would definitely support um, this video being for our students to, to watch in CMS and also um, as a board member, just watch for this this type of behavior to happen in different ways. Um, for example, the closing of a JT Williams, which has a significance of who he was and what he stood for. You know what I mean? Like just watching certain things like that, make, making sure when we have you know a Dorothy Vaughn Academy that's coming up on our on our you know Paco Magnet School, the CIP. Should we change the name? Should we move it? Do we do our kids know the significance of who Dorothy Vaughn was? So just making sure we are aware of these things that are coming up soon, but in a different format, a different form. I do want to point out that the CMS Communications Department right now is working on a campaign um, behind the name. Um, it's hashtag behind the name, and it's talking about all of our schools that have that type of history and where the extra came from. So that is being done on social media. It has been um, the last few weeks. That's interesting. Good morning, and thank you guys for <laughs> no hours of sleep. <laughs> okay. like, that's okay. Thank you guys for coming, and uh, I'm happy to meet my new person for District 1. Mm -hmm. I have not received any of your email, but I'm sure I shall. <laughs> um, it's, it's an opt-in. So. Here's, here's, here's the, this encompasses my question, and I'm trying to make it simple to answer. Do you still have the administrative program that you train teachers to be administrators in your system? If so, to what extent are you including, requiring them to include within their studies, Juneteenth particularly, Black History Month specifically? I am not aware. I, that is not something I am very familiar with, so I will defer if anybody else is aware of the program. Well, there is a leadership pipeline yeah. that goes yeah. on. There's still, there's still a leadership pipeline that, that occurs. Um, but the question is, do now with the part about the, 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 the curriculum part, I don't know about that piece. Um, yes, yes. We just brought back from UNCC. We have a group of fellow. We do have programs that we are trained in leadership. Yeah, and those that are aspiring. Be principal, but we are looking at that. This was like you said, we did it before, and we're always circling back. So we're circling back now to bring that pipeline to administrate. Well, she's asking about specifically about does it talk about you and Black History Month? We have not, yeah. we have not looked at but as far you ask first about the training, mm -hmm. we are doing some training for our principal. The Juneteenth piece, we have not. Okay, so we're just waiting to hear. From you or some or D or somebody about that part of it. Okay, um, we have three more questions, three more people, and we are really running out of time. So I need you either to direct your question to one person or direct it to everybody. I'm gonna give you like 30 seconds or one, yeah. no more than a minute to ask it. Right. We need to answer. Okay, Jack. Um, that about Juneteenth, if you could please send it to Steve. Um, and that way we can all all get it. My question had to do with Teach for America, but there's not enough time. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, here. Uh, yeah. um, rather quickly, um, Vice Chairwoman Sneed actually alluded to the four goals to gauge your success. Are there initiatives or programs that you actually have in place to get to these goals, or is that something that you're dumping on the superintendent? Well, the superintendent, 
so we monitor, we're goal monitoring. That's our, that's our responsibility. Um, superintendent is going to execute to make sure that the goals are achieved. Like, so we can't physically as board members do anything in particular to say these number of students are going to, when I'm saying executed, like we're not going to say it should be this curriculum, this evaluation process in order to make sure that goal is being met. But we, this is the responsibility of the superintendent to determine what systems need to be in place to achieve those goals. We have the responsibility to monitor and that monitoring means asking you know, strategic, tactical so questions. You, on the superintendent to create you have to. Yeah. yeah, we yeah. have to. Those in there, those are, she didn't go over them, but they're called interim goals. Yeah. That That's the strategy or the initiative to show how we're going to get to those goals. So um, the interim yeah. goals. Anywhere where people yes. can. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. it's mm -hmm. on board. She can't read all of that if you digest it all. At yeah, I, you, I have one, I started to make a bunch of copies. I have one copy here with me. Uh, okay. Gary, if you want to take it, you okay. can take that one. Okay. I can make copies if you want to email it to send it to students. I send it to oh, students. Oh, yeah. I can do that. I'll send it. And I'll make sure the links are on there. So it's a bunch of stuff in there. So it's a couple of things. One, um, before you go, D has copies of the comprehensive review plan. That's that bond package, as well as our initial uh, magnet that attached those bonds proposals. Um, and I think he has a superintendent timeline as well, which has changed by two weeks. So everything's kind of pushed back by two weeks. But I'll send those links send to Steve link so he can have all yeah, those yeah, that easily. Like, and bring more people to pick up next time. Okay. Um, was that that was your question? That was good. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mitchell. One thing that was in the paper um, on the news rather is that. Uh, black and brown boys are or kids are being suspended at six at a higher rate than than other students. What are we doing as a policy to ensure that everybody is being treated the same and deserves the same punishment for the same crime? Because obviously some people are doing the same thing and not getting and getting away. So that's it. Do you want to talk about what's your base? No, go ahead. Okay. 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 No, go ahead. Can we short on time? You want to do it? I say real quick. Um, there was a policy change on that. We just had a progress monitoring report last board meeting, but it, that we did not talk about. It was put in consent uh, consent agenda. I made a request that we have and later on in the year we talk about it because you're right. There's something wrong with that, and we need to hear what the strategy is going to be from our superintendent to fix that. So yeah. Okay. Right. Yes, and this is it. Quickly, just to uh, his earlier point, is there, I've spent a, my fair share of time in, I, in school suspended when I was younger. Is there emotional or uh, educational support for that? It gives 10 days of isolation instead of just throwing you to work? Or is there a measure in place to ensure that those students are educated? When it comes to uh, when you in school suspension? Out of school. Out of school and in school. So there's, there's some, there, I will say this, they're supposed to be. Um, education support when you're either in school suspension or out of school suspension. I think the issue may be coming in is that um, it may be occurring differently at, certain, at some schools than others. That this, that's a that's a standardized thing that we have to address. That we have to ensure that each kid is getting what they're supposed to get across the district. Um, and I think that's part of the issue that we have is there's a lot of freedom and flexibility. Um, so we have to figure out. Um, and we don't know if we don't know who's not getting what they're supposed to get at some of these short term suspension centers at some of the at, at turning point. Are they getting what they need? Um, so I think that's the short answer I can give you on that. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, but this I'm just curious as to what happened to the policy that was there was an MOU entered. Um, into some years ago, and RMJJ, Race Matters for Juvenile Justice, and Judge McCoy Mitchell and Judge Trosh assisted with that, and we saw a significant decrease in the number of suspensions. So, did somebody just get rid of that policy no. and decide to do their own thing? No, there. So, I will say the policy there was, that was years ago. There was a. If it was reported on, especially K two, K two has dropped. Tremendous. It was not K two. That's another story. This okay. is specifically focused at the high schools. Um, I don't. Community. That part I don't know. 
Okay. I'm okay. You know, okay. That should be followed. We're gonna we're gonna um, ask you to find that okay. out for us and report right. that back to us because that's an issue. Well, I, I could get a copy of it in a second. Okay. If you get a copy of it, that'd be great. But still, we need for the school board members to um, address that. I know you know, but I need them to know too. Okay. So. Um, D, if you can follow up with that for us and let us know about that. Okay. Yeah. So we, we have two things to follow up on. I was going to say, um, maybe I'm looking at you. Sneed. Stephanie. And I'm reading your title and everything. <laughs> she said March 7th and 8th. I think March 7th is on a Tuesday. And I'm not Tuesday. sure. I'm not sure what speaker you have planned, but it might be a good time to meet some of the candidates for uh who are fighting for a superintendent. We won't we won't have everybody. We won't have 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 you won't have they won't even they will not the application period won't, won't even be closed by the oh, end. Okay. Yeah. But at some point, maybe what we can say is that when it gets down to the final draft, we'll do it later for if they need to be in front of an audience, it would be nice if they could come. March 7th, though, is sorry, I was wrong with that, but maybe as Mary said, a later time. But to your point, though, March 7th may be a good time because it's community engagement right. to see if the consultants can come here as a part of Tuesday morning yeah, yeah. forum we'll to, to, to have a super to engage what you guys want in the super, next superintendent. So we'll that. Yeah. Let's look at that. Okay. And uh, but I do want to thank you. I'm sorry I rushed you at the end, but you know, <laughs> got these paper copies if anybody wants. This is the paper copy of the bond, the bond uh -huh. the CIP, anybody wants it. Okay. It's paper copy. Okay, I'll make some copies. It's a so bunch of bunch of them. Oh, you got, got copies made for yeah. people that want them. Okay. Yeah, if anybody yeah. wants anything. Okay, just put it on the back table. Yeah, I'll yeah. put it, I'll put it on the back table. Okay. Let me, let me get more. And um, she might want this. Oh. Okay. Wait a minute. Not thanks. 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 We'll be Got my marching order. Yeah. <laughs> I'm marching order. Thank you all for being here. Thank we you. appreciate you coming in today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.